Okay, welcome back everyone. Today I'm going to get into uh, chapter 11.1 .1, and I'm going to break down this video um, into its sections. And so I'll start with the interactions of skeletal muscles, then we'll get into their fascicle arrangement, and then we'll get into their lever systems. I want to point out that not all of 11 will be covered in lecture. Um, when we look at actual naming of muscles, we'll do that in visible body for the lab. Um, but you'll, it'll be clear by the time that you start this module which uh, parts will be covered in lecture and which parts will be covered in lab. And so let's get into the interactions of skeletal muscles in the body section. So remember, um, two things. Uh, when we were talking about the body movements lecture, I talked about flexion and extension. And that's sort of uh, the movement of the elbow, right? Um, flexion would be bending the elbow, and that would be decreasing the angle between... Um, two bones, and the opposite movement of that is extension, which would be increasing the angle between the two bones. Um, but in order to do that, in order to basically change the angle at a synovial joint and basically move the bones in the skeleton, a skeletal muscle that's attached to the bone must be, uh, has to be doing that work. Um, and when we talk about the movable end of the muscle that attaches to the bone, that's called the muscle's insertion and the end of the muscle that's attached to the stabilized or the fixed or the non-moving part of the bone is called the origin. So when we look at forearm flexion, which is again bending the elbow, the muscle, the brachioradialis assists the brachialis. And although a number of muscles might be involved in an action, when we look at the principal muscle or the main muscle basically that's involved, we call it the prime mover or agonist. So to lift a cup, a muscle called the biceps brachii is actually the prime mover. However, because it's assisted by the brachialis, we call the brachialis a synergist. If you ever heard the term synergy, that might make sense to you. It's like two things are kind of doing the same action. So the biceps brachii right here is the prime mover, but it's assisted here by the brachioradialis, which is the synergist. Um, a synergist can also be called a fixator if it's stabilizing the bone that is the attachment for the prime mover's origin. So slightly different terms here, and I want you to get familiar with these um, when we talk about uh, what each uh, muscle might be doing in a specific movement. So moving on, um, a muscle that has the opposite action of the prime mover is called an antagonist. That makes sense, right? If you think about a superhero movie, uh, the superheroes have one goal in mind, and the evil person has another, and the evil person is called the antagonist, right? So uh, there's nothing evil about what muscles are doing, but when the muscle is trying to move one way, if there's another muscle that does the exact opposite movement, we call that muscle the antagonist. Antagonists can have two important roles in muscle function. They can either maintain body or limb position, such as like holding your arm out or standing up or they can control rapid movement, like the ability to shadow box or check the motion of a limb, swing a bat, things like that. So the example they give here is extending the knee, where there's a group of four muscles called the quadriceps femoris, uh, which is in the anterior compartment of the thigh, that uh, are activated, and that's what you use to kick your knee out, basically, to extend the knee. If you were to flex the knee, which is to bring the, the back of your leg towards uh, your butt, that is an opposite or antagonistic set of muscles called the hamstrings. But as you can see, if I was to just talk about kicking your butt back, like uh, first, I could call the hamstrings the agonist and the quadriceps femoris the antagonist. So it's basically whatever movement you want to talk about can change which uh, of, the, of the words you use to describe. And that's listed right here. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about in this section is that there's also skeletal muscles that do not pull on the skeleton for movements. The example of that are the muscles that are in your face that produce facial expressions. And those muscles are actually attached directly into the skin. And so basically that, that's pretty interesting because normally they're attached to bone, but if you're smiling or frowning, those muscles are actually attached directly to the skin. I, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, there's also skeletal muscles in the tongue and the urinal and anal sphincters, 
and it allows for voluntary regulation of urination and defecation. And so all of those things are muscles that have no, uh, they have no um, attachment to any bones. And in addition, the diaphragm contracts and relaxes and allows you to change the volume of the pleural cavities, but it doesn't move the skeleton to do this. Okay, so that's the first section of 11.1. .1. Let's get into the next section of 11.1 .1 now. Okay, so let's get into uh, patterns of fascicle organization. So we talked about in chapter 10 uh, the organized fascicle arrangement of uh, skeletal muscle fibers. So just to qu quickly touch on that again, um, we know that skeletal muscle is enclosed in connective tissue scaffolding at three levels. And remember we called these mesia. Uh, each muscle fiber is covered by endomesium, the entire muscle is covered by epimesium, and then the bundled unit, which we call fascicle, is covered by the paramesium. Um, fascicle arrangement by the paramesia is correlated to the amount of force generated by a muscle, and it can affect the range of motion of the muscle. And there's different patterns of fascicle arrangement that skeletal muscles have, and they can be classified by that arrangement. So let's talk about the most common of fascicle arrangements now. First one I want to talk about is parallel. Parallel muscles have fascicles that are arranged in, well, parallel lines, the same direction as the long axis of the muscle. So they run down the long length of the muscle. That, that's the majority of skeletal muscles in the body will be like this. Um, some parallel muscles might be flat sheets that expand at the ends and make broad attachments, but other are going to be uh, rotund with tendons on both ends. And so sometimes you'll see muscles that might seem like plump in the, and have a large mass of tissue located in the middle of the muscle between the insertion and the origin. That's called the central body, but the, but the common term is the belly. Believe it or not, there is a belly of the muscle. When the muscle contracts, that muscle seems to, the, the belly seems to get even larger. If you uh, want to know what that is, why don't you flex your arm and notice that that part of the middle of that muscle seems to get larger. We call that the belly. It's the biceps brachii belly right here. Um, and so uh, when a muscle, uh, when a parallel muscle has that central large belly and it's spindle shape, meaning it tapers off at the end and extends at the origin and the insertions, sometimes we call that fusiform, okay? And so that's the first example. We'll next get into circular. So the next type of muscles are the circular muscles. And circular muscles are also called sphincters. You've probably heard of that before. When sphincters relax, they actually, um, they increase the size of their opening when they're relaxed. And when they contract, uh, the size of the opening shrinks to the point of closure. Um, one example is the orbic orbicularis oris muscle. It's a circular muscle that goes around your mouth. When it contracts, it becomes smaller, like when you pucker your lips for whistling, right? Um, another example is the orbicularis oculi, which you have two and one surrounds each eye. So if you look at the names of them, orbicularis oris and orbicularis oculi, you can see that the first part of the name for both is the same. And if you break it down, first part of orbicularis is orb, which is circular. And if you um, think of the word oris, that's oral, and ocular is uh, eye. So you can kind of break down muscle names to figure out where they're from if you just know a little bit of Greek uh, and Latin sometimes. Uh, there's other muscles throughout the body that are named by their shape or location. One example is the deltoid. Um, it's a triangular shaped muscle and so it got the Greek letter, uh, got the Greek name delta because that it, it looks like a triangle, that Greek letter delta. Um, the rectus abdominis, rector equals straight, and that's the straight muscle in the anterior wall of the abdomen, and the rectus femoris is the straight muscle in the anterior compartment of the thigh. So, um, also, when a muscle is a, has a widespread expansion over a big area, but then the fascicles might come to a single common attachment point, if you think about that in your mind, if a lot of things come to one point, they converge, and so this muscle is called a convergent muscle. Um, usually the attachment point for a convergent muscle could be a tendon 
or it could be a, a, a flat, broad tendon or a very slender tendon, but it's usually a tendon. Uh, one example of that is the large muscle on the chest, the pectoralis major, and, and that's an example because it converges on the greater tubercle of the humerus via a tendon. Um, the next one I want to talk about are pennate muscles. Penna means feathers, and so if you think about the structure of a feather, this is kind of the same idea. Um, basically, they'll blend into a tendon that runs through the central region of the muscle for its whole length, sort of like if you think of what a quill on a feather looks like. Um, and then the muscle the, will be arranged similarly to the feathers. So due to that design, they can only pull at an angle, and so as a result, they're not going to be able to move those tendons very far, but they can actually seem to hold a lot of tension for its size. And there's three subtypes of pennate muscles. You have unipennate muscle, which means that uni means one, and that means that the fascicles will be located on one side of the tendon. Um, a bipennate muscle means the fascicles have, are on bi as in two, two sides of the tendon. And then sometimes you'll get muscle fibers that will wrap around the tendon. And um, we will call those multipennate. Uh, so that is basically naming muscles for what they look like. Uh, you'll get a little bit more into that once you start looking at visible body, and hopefully these terms will make more sense. The last thing I want to talk about is the lever system of muscle and bone interactions. Um, as we know, skeletal muscles don't work by themselves. They are arranged in pairs based on their function. So for muscles that are attached to bones of the skeleton, their type of connection determines the force, the speed, the range of movement. These are all things we talked about before. Um, the skeleton and the muscles have to act together to move the body. Like, so have you ever used the back of a hammer to remove a, a nail that's stuck in some wood? The handle acts as a lever and the head acts as the fulcrum. If you're not sure what those are, you should look up the tools um, because all things in physics work the, basically the same way. The fixed point that you're applying the force to when you pull uh, is the fulcrum. Right? And then the lever, it allows you to extend a greater force. Um, so basically, our musculoskeletal system works in a similar manner to most tools. Um, they, say that, uh, they say if you look at biology, you'll figure out ways in order to do the work that you need to do. Because basically, biology has figured it out over millions of years of evolution. So basically, the load uh, would be any object that you're lifting or any resistance to a movement, and you can uh, use the, your skeletal muscle and your bones in order to overcome that load. Okay, so that's it for section 11.1. .1. Let me know if you have any questions on this one, as always, and look forward to the next one coming very soon.